Hi guys, it's Mrs. Seitz. Today what you're going to be working on is representations of functions. And your essential question is, how can you represent a function in different ways? In the first activity that you guys are going to be copying and following along with is we are going to be describing a function. So we are going to be copying, completing a mapping diagram for the area of the figure and then writing an equation that describes the function. So if you remember, if you take a look at the first figure, it's a triangle. To get the area of a triangle, it's area equals one half the base times the height. Okay, and if I take a look at the base, it would be the entire part of the triangle. So I would add up two and two to get four. And then the height would be x. So to start simplifying this a little bit, half of four is two. So to get that, I would do two times x to get my area. So when I start taking a look at my inputs, I would be inputting in one, two, three, and four in four x, and then to be figuring out my output. So if I do this, two times one would give me an output of two. Two times two would give me an output of four. Two times three, would give me an output of six, and two times four would give me an output of eight. So for an input value for a height of one would give me an output of area of two, an input for height of two would give me an output for area of four, an input of three for height would give me an output of area for six, and so on for an, an input of four for height and give me an output of area for eight. We're going to do the same thing here for this trapezoid. Okay, the area formula for a trapezoid is one half times your base one and base two. So in our case, base one is x and base two would be two x. And we're going to multiply that by our height, which is two. So to simplify this down with us a little bit, x and two x gives me three x. And I know half of two is one. So to simplify that even further, one times three X is gonna give me three X. So we're gonna complete this the same way. So for an input value of X, which is one, to get the output for the area, three times one is three. And we're gonna do the same thing for the other ones. Three times two, six. Three times three, nine. And three times four, 12. So our answers again are three, six, nine, and 12. For the next activity, you need to use a table. So that's another representation of a function. We're gonna make a table that shows the pattern for an area where the input for the figure is the number X and the output is the area. And then we're gonna write an equation that describes the function. Then we're gonna use the equation to find which air figure has an area of 81 when the pattern continues. So one thing at a time. All right, so again, we're gonna set up a nice little table. So we're gonna say that X stands for our input. And then we're gonna say the output is our area. Okay, and it also tells us there's one square unit here. So if I look for this, if I have our figure number, so that will be for the first, we're looking at this shape. For figure number one, the output or the number of blocks I have is one. For figure two, I have three blocks. For figure three, there's one, two, three, four, five blocks. And for figure four, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven blocks. Okay, so I did the first part where I made a nice little table. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write an equation that describes the function. So here's how I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna start looking at those patterns that I see. And we've been doing this in the past with our inputs and our outputs. If we take a look at the input pattern, I can see that I'm going up by ones every single time. And our outputs 
we're going up by twos every time. Well, I remember in the past to get slope, slope is change in y over change in x. Well, I just learned that another name for y is an output and another name for x is an input. So if I do the change in my output over the change in my input, I'm going to get my slope. So the change in my output is 2 because that was our pattern we saw in our outputs. And then the pattern we saw in our inputs was 1. So our slope is 2. And then to figure out our y-intercept, we're actually going to count backwards. So instead of adding 1, I'm going to subtract 1. So I'm going to start at 0. So instead of adding 2 every single time, well, if I started at 1 and I'm going to subtract by 2, 1 minus 2, let's see, that's going to give me, let's see, negative 1. And that would give me a starting point. Because remember, to find a y-intercept, that's when your x value is 0. So all I did was reverse my pattern to get there. So when I get my answer for my equation, it's going to be y equals 2x minus 1. Or if I'm following what I have in the problem, the area equals 2 times the input minus 1. Okay, and if I check that out, let's see if it works. 2 times my input of 4, so 2 times 4 is 8, and 8 minus 1 is 7, so yep, that gave me the area of 7. All right, let's see if I answered everything here. Ooh, I have to use my equation now to find when the figure has an area of 81 and see what the pattern is, or to see what the figure number is. All right, so to do that, I know the area has to be 81, so I'm going to plug in an 81 in for area, and I'm going to solve for x. So if I add 1 to both sides, I'm going to get 82. And if I divide both sides by 2, I'm going to see what pattern that would be. So that meant if I would continue these, this little pattern with the shapes, and I would keep putting on more and more little squares, it would take me up to figure 41 to do that, but it would give me figure 41 for my answer. Okay. Let's do this also, guys, for the next one, okay? So let's see if we can continue this with our patterns. So again, here's your figure number, and here's your area. Okay, figure one has an area of one. Figure two has an area of four. Figure three has an area of, well, you have to count up all your blocks, but there is a total of nine, and figure four has an area of 16 if you count up all those blocks, okay? Well, if we try to figure out what the change is, if I try to count up my change, there's a change of adding one. If I try to figure out if there's a pattern with these guys, let's see, this would be adding three, this would be adding five. There's definitely a pattern, but it's not the same number every single time. So that would mean we don't have a linear pattern. Okay, so what's actually happening this time, if you look from maybe here to here instead, 1 times 1 gives me 1, 2 times 2 gives me 4, 3 times 3 gives me 9, and so on and so on and so on. So guess what? Here's your equation. To get the area, you'd be taking your input value and multiplying it by itself. Another way you can write that is your input squared would give you your area. So how could I get an area of 81? What figure number would I have to start with? Well, what number times what number would give you 81? That answer would be 9. Quick way you could do that is square rooting, but we'll be learning that soon. OK, another way that you can represent a function is by using a graph. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to use this graph to test the truth value of a statement. And if a statement is true, we're going to write an equation that shows how we can obtain one measurement to find the other one. So if you look at the statement, it says, you can find the horsepower of a race car engine if you know its volume in cubic inches. Okay, 
Well, when I take a look at this, okay, I'm going to do a quick little sketch out here. So let's say this is 200, okay, and then we'll go by hundreds. We'll say that's 300, this is 400, that's 600, and this is our volume. And then we'll say this is our horsepower. Okay, and again, I'm going to go by hundreds. So that's 200. I'll say okay, I'll skip a space. 300, 400. I'll call that 600. Okay, so we're going to estimate a little bit, but 200 and about 375. 350 and about 650 would be about here. 350 and about 250 would be about here. And 500 and about 600 would be here. Okay, so what we're trying to determine right now is if you can find the horsepower of a race engine if you know it's volume in cubic inches. And when I look at this graph and I look at the table, here's something that's kind of bothering me right now. I have two values at 350, okay? This is not passing our function test, right? So that means that I'm not going to be able to determine if something is true if I have the same exact va value for two different things. So the statement is false. Okay, let's see it with this one. Okay, you can find the volume of a race car engine in cubic centimeters if you know its volume in cubic inches. Okay, so again, I'm just gonna make a quick little sketch of this. Okay, and I'm gonna go up by hundreds again. So this is 100, this is 200, 300, and I'm just gonna label every one, other one, 500, 600, okay? Then on the uh, y-axis, I'm gonna go by thousands. So this is 1,000. And this one would be 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. And again, this is just an estimate for us, okay? So if I'm at 100 and then 1,600, 200 and about 3,200, and then 300 with about 4,900, Okay, oops, that should be able to appear. Okay, you can kind of see that this is eventually starting to form a limus. It looks like a little bit of a line, okay? And you can also see that this also passes our function test, right? Each input has its own special output, okay? So because each input has its own special output, it passes the function test, right? So we could say that this is true, okay? And because it looks like it's almost starting to form a line, we can also write an equation to show how we could obtain one measurement. And here's how we're going to do that. We're going to look to see if we can find those patterns. Okay, so the pattern with my input or my x's, it looks like it's going up by 100. So I'm going to write plus 100, and I'd like you guys to do the same. All right, we're going to get our pattern with our y's. Okay, now I know it's going from 1640 to 3280. So remember, if you're not quite sure what number it's going up by, take your bigger number, which is 3280, and we're going to subtract it with 1640. So it looks like it's potentially going up by 1640 each time. So let's just check it and do 3280 plus 1,640, and yes, it does equal 4,920, okay? So to remember, to get your slope, you're gonna do your change in your output over your change in your input. So I'm gonna do 1640 over 100, and that's gonna give me about 16.4. Okay, so that's giving me my slope. To get your y-intercept, which is the other piece that you need, 
let's reverse it. So instead of adding 100, I'm going to subtract 100, and that's going to bring me to zero. Instead of adding 1640, I'm going to subtract 1640 from 1640, and I'm going to end up at zero. So it's a quick way to get your y-intercept. So that means my equation is going to be y equals 16.4x plus zero. And you can always check it using the table button to see if you are correct. All right, the last part of our activity for today is the table shows the average speed of winners of the Daytona 500. Okay, we are going to see if, first of all, if we can graph the data and see if you can graph to predict future winning speeds, okay, and then explain why or why not. So again, we're going to take a look and we're going to first say the x-axis is our years and the y-axis will be our speeds. So let's label the x and y-axis. Okay, we could start out with 2004 and we're going to label each one, 2005 and so on. 2006, 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And you can see that it looks like we have values in the Y's, the speeds that range from about, it looks like 130 is our smallest. And it looks like our largest is like around like 156. So we're going to go about to up to 160. So I'm going to go by fives. So I'm going to label every other, so 135, 140, 145, 150, 155, 160, 165, 170, and that should be good, okay? All right, so I'm going to start plotting these points. So 2004 with 156, 2005 with 135. 2006 with 143, 2007 with 149, 2008 with 153, 2009 with 133, 2010 with 137, 2011 with 130 and 2012 with 140. Okay, we can kind of see our points are all over the place. Okay, and we don't have a really clear looking, it almost doesn't look like a line. It's like jumping all over the place, right? So it's not very consistent with whatever number we're going up by. Okay, I don't really see like we're dropping here. If I do 156 minus 135, this is dropping 21, okay? Then it looks like 135. Let's see, to get from 143 to 135, looks like I'm going up eight. So there's like not really a clear pattern here, okay? So can you use the graph to predict future winning speeds? No. And we're gonna say there's not a clear pattern. And you can see there's not a clear pattern both in the table or in the graph, okay? So again, the point of this activity was to see what either in your table or in your graph that we can see patterns if we have functions. And if you have functions in particular, if you see a pattern, that might be considered a linear function. But more details to follow about that soon.